go ahead and introduce uh, Commissioner Tracy. Uh, Clint Tracy was reared in Cape Girardeau and is a Cape Girardeau Central High graduate. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland, and holds an MBA from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and a master's degree in strategic studies from the United States Army War College at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He served on active duty with the Navy for seven years and is currently serving as captain in the Navy Reserve as the commanding officer of Naval Reserve Fleet Logistics Center. I had trouble when I tried to practice this. Yokoshpa? Yokuska. Yokuska, Japan. After leaving active duty, Clint worked in the timber industry before being recalled to active duty to participate in Operation Iraqi Freedom. After returning home, he was elected to the Missouri House of Representatives where he served one term from 2009 to 2010. After leaving the Missouri House, Clint won election and is currently serving as presiding commissioner of Cape Girardeau County, where he resides with his wife, Carrie, sons, Theodore and Oliver. And please uh, welcome Clint Tracy. Thanks, Jan. Appreciate the, the intro. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. See so many folks who are uh, interested and engaged in, in local government. Um, you know, usually uh, county government's not the most exciting thing. Um, I enjoy it, and I, I like to talk about it. So um, tonight, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about uh, county government. Talk about a little bit about the state, um, counties, and then specifically county commissioners and, and what we do, what our job is how we interact with the other uh, local officials and uh, talk about some of the duties we have as, as county officials. So at the end, we'll take a few questions. Um, hopefully I can answer them adequately. We'll see what, we'll see what comes. So we'll kind of do a uh, stump each other back to you. <laughs> so, um, so at a high level, um, the counties are, are basically an extension of the state. Counties are, we, we're governed by the state constitution and, and state statute. Um, the Constitution lays out about how the counties are going to be organized. We're organized by size. There's uh, one, two, three, four classes of counties. Cape County is a first class county because we're one of the biggest counties. Um, we've got 114 counties in the state. There, I think, are four or five charter counties um, which adopt a different government style. They have an uh, executive director as opposed to the three member commission. Um, every other county, 114 of us, we have three commissioners. Most counties are divided either north and south um, by district. So you get a northern or southern commissioner, eastern or western. Cape is unique in the fact that half our population lives in the city of Cape. And so district two commissioner is basically the city of Cape. District one commissioner is all of the out county. So, um, and then the presiding is elected countywide. I believe you've had some other county officials here. Um, presiding commissioner and, and the collector or auditor, assessor and treasurer, they're all elected countywide. So um, our last census put us right about 81,000 people. So I'm not sure we're quite big enough to discuss a charter um, form of government. It's, it's, it's been kind of an ongoing discussion around the county um, about whether Cape County should be a, a charter government or not and, and kind of get away from the three member commission. Um, it's a good discussion, um, one that obviously is, is uh, governed by the, by the state. Um, chapter 49 of the, the state statutes talks about county commissions, county commissioners, duties and responsibilities. Um, I'm glad that other county officials have spoken with you already. Uh, many times folks think that uh, the other elected officials work for the commission and we ought to do something about something with another office. Um, and, and we're all independent boat rowers. We all are our own canoes. Um, each is independently elected and accountable, frankly, to you. Um, just like the commissioners, we're all elected by you and we're accountable to you. So um, no, one, no one works for the commission um, as far as elected, other elected office holders and, uh, and all of their duties and responsibilities are also likewise 
articulated either in the Constitution or, or state statute. Um, uh, one that comes to mind in the Constitution is election, so the clerk has to has to take some guidance from the Constitution as well as state statute. So <clears throat> that's kind of how we're how we're organized. Um, things the commission's in, in charge of. So we are kind of the administrative function of the county. Um, while every office holder is in charge of their own office, the commissioners are in charge of the budget. So um, Cape County, we've got uh, twenty some million dollar budget mostly run from sales tax, um, a little bit of property tax, some fees, court fees, things like that. Um, so it's our job to have interviews with every office holder, talk about their needs for their office, how many employees they need, um, their budgets, put those together. Um, the auditor brings us kind of a, a package of, hey, here's what next year's budget request is, and here's kind of what we're looking at as far as revenue. So we, we've got to go through and match those up, make sure that, uh, um, you know, we, we can't spend more money than we have. We're not like the federal government. We don't get to print money. Um, <laughs> novel concept, but uh, we all we all live by it. Sometimes you wish they would too. Um, so we go through that process and um, identify priorities and, and go through every every office holder's budget and at the end of the year pass a budget for the calendar year. So we run on a on a on a January through December budget year. Unlike the federal government runs October uh, through September, so um, that's that's how we're funded. Some responsibilities of the commission. So there's three of us, and uh, we, in many cases we divide and conquer. Sometimes we work together. Um, one of the biggest is the the county roads and bridges. So um, state lettered highways. If you live on a highway that's A through Z or double letter, that's a state road. Um, county county highways are blue signs with yellow yellow numbers, usually three of them, and that uh, comes with the responsibility of the county commission. Um, we've got a special road district in this county, which is unique. Um, in a nutshell, it uh, just a farm to market roads in the past. Folks that lived on the periphery of cities, i.e. Cape Girardeau, said, you know what, I live right next to Cape Girardeau, and um, I would like my property tax for road and bridges to go toward roads that are closer to the city of Cape and maybe not necessarily to an outlying part of the county. So the state legislature created a thing called special road districts. So basically think of a donut, a lot more of like a sea because Cape's on the river. Um, the area outside the city limits of Cape is the Cape Special Road District where the people that lived in that district, their road and bridge property tax specifically went to maintain their roads in that donut. So um, when it started about 95 miles a road would take and, and, and that their money specifically fixed their roads. Well, um, I think 2006, the county passed Prop 1, which is a sales tax, and that it, it eliminated all the county's uh, road and bridge property taxes. So right now, if you look at your property tax bill, road and bridge should say zero. And that was because we traded the, the uh, property tax for the sales tax. Well, the folks who lived in that donut benefited because the agreement was that they would still get the same amount of money to maintain those roads. However, um, as the city of Cape grows, the number of roads, number of miles in, in that district gets smaller. So, so they're well below 95 miles. They get the same amount of funding. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting precarious thing that can happen in government sometimes if you don't take a long-term strategic view of how to address and maintain things sometimes uh, a problem is maybe identified and then you kind of move on and nobody says well should that road district get smaller as the city gets bigger or should the road district bump out a proportional you know maintain that whatever mile or two buffer and so you know that's that's a side note on the importance of making good policy. So <clears throat> the county, we've got about 500 miles of county road, uh, about half of them are paved. We've got a program that uh, identifies folks if you live on county road that's not paved, um, how you can get that done. And it's driven by money. And basically it's first come first serve. So if your road signs up, everybody gives the easements required so we can get in there and do the construction that we need to do to make the road wide enough. Um, you put a ditch in, then uh, once everyone agrees to that, you get you put on the list, and then as we have as money allows, uh, we just move down the list. So we've got a list with 
um, several miles of road on it. Um, unfortunately, we have more miles that need to be paved than money to pave. Um, these economic times are, are exacerbating the problem. I think last year we were buying asphalt at $45 a ton, and that's more than doubled this year. So um, the effect is uh, inflation is, is felt, we feel it too. So um, uh, Commissioner Kepler, he's, he's He's, uh, we're fortunate to have somebody with a professional, he's a, a civil engineer background. So uh, builds and, uh, he's built roads and bridges for a career. And so he brings that, that expertise to the county. So we're fortunate to have him. Um, other things the commission does. So we're in charge of emergency management. So as presiding commissioner, uh, the, the chief elected officer of the county. So if we have a tornado, we have a, a disaster, a flooding. Um, we, we have to set up an emergency, declare an emergency within the county. Um, we set up, we have an organization to, to you know, civilian chain of command to address that. So we have some limited resources, we've got some equipment, we've got uh, agreements with the city of Cape and Jackson in case we need more manpower. If, uh, if it's a large scale disaster, say, say we have the uh, tornado like they did in Joplin, that would be overwhelming for the county. So we would have to go to the state and say, we need some additional resources. The governor would have to decide whether or not to, to uh, nationalize or mobilize the National Guard, bring them in from somewhere and, and help with uh, debris removal, whatever, whatever was needed. If, if the state gets overwhelmed, then uh, the, the governor makes a request to the federal government and FEMA kicks in. So that's, uh, it's an organization and, a, and a, a framework that needs to be in place and people need to understand how it works in the county, one that we hope you never have to use. So um, again, we've got emergency manager, um, maintain those relationships and those, and those scenarios, communication's a big deal. So we've kind of focused on that. We spent uh, CARES money on, on some radios to make sure that uh, if we have a disaster that, that our folks can talk to each other because that's the first step, right? If you can't, you can't talk to each other, you can't coordinate, if you can't coordinate, you can't you can uh, respond. So emergency management, that's uh, one of the things that, uh, again, hopefully you know, we never have to deal with, but it's important to know that, that somebody's taking care of that. Um, another one is uh, economic development, which it's always, uh, it's always on the forefront. People, people want more economic development. Um, you know, I'm a little torn on, on you know, what effect the government can really have on economic development. We have a few tools in our toolbox. Again, those are outlined by the state legislators. They say, um, you know, you have the ability to maybe abate some taxes, um, some special programs within the cities where they use community development, um, tax abatements or, or set asides. Um, how many people in here are small business owners? Okay, so if you want to know where economic development happens, it's the folks with your hands raised. And, and, and a good measure of how we're doing. Anybody thinking about expanding, hire more people, grow their business? Okay, okay, so it's mixed, but that's that's probably 90% of, of economic development comes from folks who are here, established businesses who say, you know what, we, we provide this service or and, and, and we're gonna grow, we need to hire more people. And so um, there's, there's kind of the chicken and egg, you gotta have folks to hire, they've gotta be, here and available and wanting to work. And we find that as uh, you know, some different groups have done economic studies in Cape County, on one hand, we're blessed because unemployment is very low. Everybody apparently that wants a job has one, but that's also a double-edged sword because if you want to grow and you want to hire 10 people, everybody has a job that wants one. So how, how do you facilitate a discussion where we can encourage growth, we can encourage people to come here whether they go to SEMO and stay, and then you know find that this is a great place to live, raise a family, go to school, do all those things. Um, how do we how do we make this county more enticing for folks to do that? And uh, believe me, there, there's no magic wand that the government can wave because we would have already done it. <laughs> um, so looking at that realistically and, and the resources that we have and, and having those discussions, um, you know. Everybody says, hey, we would like more economic opportunity here, and I think that's great. But basically, it comes down to folks willing to invest in this area, um, looking at our, you know, and they make those decisions based on personal choices. So, 
Um, there are some organizations that are focused on economic development who, who are there in case uh, companies have questions. They want, they want land, they want to know about site surveys, they want to know, you know, do you have the infrastructure that we need to do X, Y, or Z? So we, we've got some of those people in place that can facilitate those discussions, they can answer questions. Um, you know, unfortunately, there, there are other places that give land away so you can get 100 acres for free. And uh, Cape County just isn't one of those places. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the economic climate that we're up against. And then, and then compound that with recent turn of events with economic uh, conditions with inflation, inflationary pressure, all the, all the things that we see coming out of uh, the federal government um, seems to be retarding that growth. So that's not, that's not really good news. Um, but we, we did find in our, last, in, in our last census that the county grew to, I think, 81,000. So we, we gained a couple thousand people. So hopefully, you know, there, there are things here that are bringing folks to the county that, uh, that, that will lead to some more economic growth. <coughs> Okay, so day-to-day, um, -day. yes, sir. Economic development yeah. is one of the jobs of the county government. You said, okay, what kind of money do we spend out of the budget on that? And what kind of man hours do we expend on economic development? Sure. So um, Cape County is, is a member of what, what was called the Magnet, the, the, um, which was an associate, is an association made up of the city of Cape, Jackson, the county, uh, the chamber, SEMO, um, and basically uh, paid to hire this entity to respond to, to questions, to, to liaison between businesses, to, to do some outreach, to, to find out where site selectors are. So there's, there's a whole, um, it's a whole economic, um, uh, kind of a association, uh, you know, the site selectors, there's a whole business revolved around chasing down leads for businesses and, and finding sites for them. So, so, so think about like, if you want a job, you can call a headhunter to find you a job in a certain industry around the country. There are site selectors and, and they do the same thing for businesses that are, that are interested in moving. So, so liaisoning with those, those, those entities, going to places where people are talking about um, economic development trends, those kind of things, that's, that's what the magnet did. So they're, they're currently taking a, they're, you know, we're taking a hard look at, you know, here's what we've done, it doesn't work. Is it, has it been productive? Have we seen growth from, from this activity? Is it worth doing? And so, you know, those, those are questions, it's, you know, it's easy to do what you did, I and mean, you usually get what you got. Um, but it, it, it's good to take it probably a step back and say, well, can we do something better? What, what kind of businesses can we attract? Take a look at Cape County, what are the, the demographics, what kind of natural resources we have? We've got a river, we've got a college, we've got all these assets, you know, how, you know, how, how do we best leverage them? And, and so to have those discussions, it's, you know, frankly, a good you know good place to start um, there's some businesses that we probably will never get here this this uh, again with, with limited workforce we're probably never going to get an auto manufacturing plant with 1200 jobs just because as I said we don't have 1200 people without a job um, so so there's certain skill sets when when industry is looking and, and you've probably heard the debates with the university or the technical college or the community college and, and really all that is centered around how do we provide folks with quality training, whether it's four years or two years or a certificate, so that when they finish the program, they have a skill that then they can go get a job. That should be the focus of education, right? We're, we're teaching people how to, how to be, we should be teaching them to be good citizens. That's part of it. But the other side of being a good citizen is learn a skill, learn a trade, and then go go to work, go do that thing. So, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion around the country. You see colleges, I, I heard a college uh, president recently talking about a six-year program for an undergrad. And I thought, you gotta be kidding me. 
Like, what are we doing to these kids? You want them to take six years to get an undergrad? Holy cow. I mean, that's just, to me, that's just wrong. I mean, it's, it's flat wrong, and it's almost, you know, you're stealing from them almost. You're, you're setting them up to go get a, go get a $100,000 loan or $150,000, whatever it is, and then you graduate with an underwater basket weaving degree, and you're going to go get a job for thirty grand, doing something totally unrelated. Like that—that that can't be the way that, that we're really looking at education. So, <clears throat> part of the magnet, part of that discussion, the, the debate over having a facility that can adequately train folks, I think we're spot on. And whether it's—I mean, they're, they've talked about pre private technical schools, um, you know. Providing, you know, what, what's the what's the economy look like in this age? What are the, the technical skills that people need? And whether it's coding or, you know, uh, specialty welding or whatever it is, how do how do we how do we, how do we create an entity or find an entity that's nimble enough and agile enough to provide training? Like I said, that, that gets people in a position where they can go get a job and go go to work. So that's. Uh, that's you know in the economic development discussion because again you've got to have trained workers before companies are even you know, will even entertain coming to an area. You may say yeah, you know you got good schools, the parks look great, there's plenty of churches, all the things that that you look for 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 quality of life, but you're not producing folks that can go work in in, in, a, in a specific trade. So um, that's that's another swim lane of that whole economic development piece. It's not just how much tax money can we give away to you know bribe somebody to come here? It's you know how much uh, <laughs> you know you, you sit out at the table and, and and people say, well you know we lost the business because we didn't give away enough tax money. Well, I'm not going to feel bad about that. Um, you know if the company's willing to come here and and invest in our community, provide good jobs, then we can have the discussion, and we have it in the public and. Everybody gets to weigh in and say, you know that, you know, you may not like it, but that's that's kind of the going rate. That's what's going on around the country, and, and you get feedback and you say, is that good for Cape County or not good for Cape County? Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, we've, we've had to say like that's probably not going to be good for Cape County at times. All right, I'm talking so long, we're wearing out the microphone. So. <laughs> So economic development. So that that's one of those things that it's always kind of you know always on the always a discussion. It's hard to it, it you know I've found that it's it's hard to say well you know we spent ten thousand dollars doing X and then we got Y in return and that's really the questions that that I've asked is what for the money we're spending what what are we getting in return what are we what's our return on, on our investment that so we don't spend a lot of money I think we spend. Um, Cape County partners for sixty thousand a year, and part of that with the city was the same. Um, like I said, so enough to have a staff that could respond to these requests to go meet with these site selectors and and bring us back some information, provide the the conduit for the discussion. So um, that's 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 the economic piece. So you were telling about this. Oh yeah. Okay. So, what else we do? Several boards and commissions around the county. Um, if, if if you've got some free time and you want to get involved, we've got a lot of volunteer uh, boards and commissions. Whether it's a uh, water district or a, a, an SP40, which uh, deals with uh, developmental disabilities, um, we've got a senior citizens board. Um, a lot of a lot of different opportunities. If if you want to get involved and 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 serve, we we sure would appreciate it. Um, it's a way to get plugged into your community, maybe maybe get outside what you normally do and, and get involved with a different group. Um, like I said, unfortunately, they're volunteers, so you need some free time, but uh, definitely a way to, to, to understand what, what's going on in the county. Um, something else that, uh, that particularly the Cape County does, and, and, and not every county does, but we are, um, fairly involved at the state level with the, the association of counties so part of what uh, what we find is that um, starting in, in january um, that's when the state legislature starts 
there's a lot of a lot of great ideas flying around and a lot of things being discussed and we find that um, sometimes they're not vetted through the county lens i.e how does that affect county government or county citizens so the state law would be would be great for x y or z however it creates a whole unfunded mandate or a, a Basically, that's usually what it comes down to. It costs us more money to do business. And, and unfortunately, um, because of the nature of the way the state government's set up and the county is set up, um, and part, partially around term limits, so a lot of discussion about term limits in the Constitution. Um, we found that, uh, you know, here we, we've said that if, if the feds ever go, ever go to term limits, that for federal offices that, that we're going to do it also. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing when you, when you look at term limits, the, the effect that it has on your state's ability to govern and the quality of, of governance. Um, and that's, that's a big difference I think you find between the county and the state level is this. So state reps, term limit eight years, state senators, term limit eight years. Um, so what you find is that, uh, and, and so full disclosure, when I started my first election, I was all for term limits. You know, we, we, it's easy to look at the federal government and say, eh, we don't, we don't like that. We don't want that. <clears throat> well, there's a trade-off. It's, it's usually not as simple as, well, if, if, we, give, if we put term limits, then, then we don't get what, what the feds have. Um, there's some second and, and tertiary order of effects. And one of those is that when you send people to Jeff City to govern, um, they may be subject matter experts, and I'm just gonna pick one because there's, you see all kinds of folks. You see young attorneys, you see retired teachers, you see I mean, all kinds of folks serve in Jeff City. So, so, so say you're a retired teacher. So you're a subject matter expert in teaching kids in the classroom. And that's fabulous. That's a that's a great perspective to bring. It's one of the main core functions we've said that the state of Missouri should handle is educate, you know, handle education. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're a subject matter expert in funding education. There's a difference. So when when we don't give individuals who actually vote who we can keep accountable an opportunity to become subject matter experts in whatever their field is, and the Constitution goes through it. It's public safety, education, you know, all the functions of the state. Somebody's gotta be the expert. Well, who's, who is that? It, it, we don't give, in my opinion, we don't give the legislators a long enough tenure to become an expert. Eight years, you know, that's eight years of meeting five months a year is, is, is not long enough to become an expert. They say it takes like 10,000 hours to master something, become a professional. That's not 10,000 hours. Um, so, so who is the expert? Well, the lobbyists. The lobbyists are the experts. If, if, you, if you pull any legislator out of the hall and you say, hey, what, what do you think about this issue? Or who's, who's, who's the, I mean, there are legislators that have their issues, so they may be the expert in that. But if it's something peripheral, if it's utilities, if it's gambling, casinos, lottery, any of those other things in the Constitution that are kind of awkward, marijuana? Yeah. Well, I, I talk to the lobbyists about that, and that's where they get their information. Or I talk to the, the senior member of the committee who talks to the lobbyists to get their information. So. That's, that's a real ramification of term limits, like it or not, that's, that's what happens. So you now have ceded, we as the people have ceded that power to hold somebody accountable because the lobbyists are running the show. Guess how long some of those guys and gals have been there? They, they were old when I was there 10 years ago. They were old when I was there 10 years ago. So 2009, there were guys, I mean, <laughs> I mean, anecdotally, one guy, they banned smoking in the Capitol, except for one lobbyist, was grandfather. <laughs> one dude could smoke in the, in the state Capitol because he had been there for, I don't know, I don't know just Moby Dick was a minimum, I guess. I mean, 
I mean, how ridiculous is that? Like, we're gonna we're gonna make a law. You can't smoke. This is a, this is tobacco free. I mean, and that was after. I mean, I went to Cape Central. We had a smoking cage when I was there. I mean, you think about that today. You had a smoking cage for the kids. For the kids. Yeah. Not anymore. I mean, but so so. Cape Central got rid of their smoking cage, and there's one guy that can still smoke in the Capitol. Unbelievable. So, I mean, it matters. So who's, who's running the state? Who's bringing all these great ideas? And look, early on when we, when, so the, so one, I don't want to be partisan, one party took control in 2002, have had it ever since. Um, I think term limits hampers their, our ability to govern. I mean, think about it like this. Nobody told Albert Pujols, you hit too many home runs, you gotta go somewhere else. Professional sports teams do not get rid of their all-stars if they're performing. Something to think about. So, uh, and that's, I mean, I know it's counter to what, you know, the, the, the traditional thing is with the, with the term limits, and I mean, I get it. Like, you look at look at some folks that have been in D.C. forever, and you're like, yeah, I wish, I wish somebody else, sorry. Joe Biden. Yes, whoever it, whoever it is, both sides can point at folks and say, hey, you know, they've been there too long, they've been there, uh, they should do something else. But the fact of the matter is, there's some stat like 90% of, of constituents love their congressperson, but hate everybody else's. So the people that are sending those folks to D.C. love them in their district. So they got, you know, Pick, pick a name, whoever it is, been there forever, has 750,000 constituents that think they're doing a bang up job. Now, now we may not, you know, we may not agree, but you know, if, if, if we fire our, if we fire our representative every two years, you, you, you can never, you can never gain a foothold and get anything done, good or bad. That's really. good. I mean, it, it may be, but, but, but do you think the lobbyists, I mean, I was talking about Missouri lobbyists. You want to talk about federal lobbyists? I mean, that's that's a different that's a, that's a whole different ball game, right? So, so we're just talking about little old Missouri, one out of fifty. You know, the the, the weight that our lobbyists are throwing around, um, and and they're they're influential. Don't don't think they're not. I mean, we we have marijuana in our constitution. I know, and farming, yes, and farming, Game. and bingo. Yes, I mean, come on, you know. You know, ours is like what, 600, no, it's 350, 330 pages, something like that. 15 of that is the U.S. Constitution. There's only seven articles. Missouri has like 14. Like, you, it, you're like, come on, is that the best we can do? <laughs> Have you seen the four amendments? Oh, sorry. So, 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 even, even, even the, uh, the, the uh, petition amendment process. Um, which which has come up, you know, there's there's a lot of discussion about, it's so easy to change our constitution, maybe we need to slam the farm door shut, the barn door shut after the cows are all out, and, and you're like, well, okay, maybe, it's, it's a fair discussion to have, but at least let's leave an emergency valve that whatever's in there today, if we wanted to take it out, it would take the same number of votes. Like, let's not, let's not raise the bar after we got all this junk in there if we want to take it out. Let's say, well, if you only need 10 votes to get in there the first time, then you only need 10 votes to get out. But if you want to put anything else in there that's, that's uh, you know, let's raise the bar now, but, but let's, not, let's not make it impossible to get rid of some of that stuff. I mean, do you think that maybe we could, could clean that up a little bit? But again, those, those aren't necessarily discussions that folks really want to have, and, and why not? Well lobbyists like access to the Constitution because it enshrines some things that should have been codified in law if even addressed at all, right? I mean, so so those that 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 relationship with, with folks in, in DC and in Jeff City is important. Um, because at the county level you really find folks who have who have served and been there. Um, a, a typical store would be, you know, somebody worked in the collector's office or the reporters or the assessors for for several years and then whoever was the office holder retired and then they run and then they take over. I mean, county county government is not partisan. I mean, we, we don't talk about partisan issues necessarily. 90% of the discussion is um, the state's trying to do this to us. It's gonna cost us more money 
it's going to be harder for us to operate. Um, why are they trying to do that? And, and so really, um, you find folks at the county level who are, they're, they're professionals in what they do. So we're fortunate in Cape County, I commend the people I work with, they're all professionals. It's not like that everywhere in the, in the state, unfortunately. You, you hear about commissioners and clerks that don't get along, or you know, a lot of, a lot of infighting, backbiting in the courthouse. We don't have that here. Um, I mean, it's, there's office politics, there's anywhere. You're, you're dividing money up among 13 in, entities and you got some judges in there. And so it can get, the base can get spirited, but it's, 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 it doesn't get taken personal. And so, um, like I said, we've got a, a, great, a great crew to work with. You guys have, I think, elected uh, responsible individuals, take their job seriously. And, and, and do a good job and work well together. So, you know, I, I'll say thanks for that because I appreciate appreciate you liking me and sending other folks who are, who are like-minded and, and easy to work with. Um, so um, that, that piece is, is definitely, so, so as a county, as an association of counties, we are very engaged in, try to be as much as we can, because again, we don't get to vote, but engaged in policy making decisions um, around local government for sure. Um, there's some other other issues that you know will most of it has to do with unfunded mandates so that's uh, how we do it time. we're fine um so yeah statutes that govern you um chapter 49 is, is kind of a, oh, oh, a question that, yeah. yes ma'am yeah. no no wait a minute. no 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 oh, not yet. i'm sorry oh, you. we're gonna wait hey janet i'm sorry we're gonna wait Can on we questions we're gonna let him okay, finish. okay. sorry so hold that though um so there's three of us. So, so some big things that, that have happened in this county. Um, 2020, build a new courthouse. Um, process that, that frankly started in uh, 2011 when uh, then Representative Wallingford changed a shout to a May. Anybody know the story? All right, and I'll tell it. Um, so, um, Cape County was one of, I think, two that was required by state statute to have two courthouses, you, us in Marion County. And so it goes back to history of Cape. There's some disputes about the, about the county seat, about who owned the land. Um, anyway, the population center was Cape. However, Jackson became the county seat. The courthouse supposed to be in the county seat. The compromise was, well, for Cape not to move the county seat to Cape, and that was the, the question about the, the loyalist landowner and, and the history is kind of fascinating. But the compromise was, okay, you'll, you'll operate two courthouses, which, okay, twice the cost, twice the headache. Mm -hmm. you, you can't imagine, just, you know, if you're the, if you're the circuit clerk and, and you went to Cape and you're supposed to be in Jackson and courts in 10 minutes and you files here, I mean, just a nightmare, frankly. So, um, uh, then Representative Wallingford, he changed the Cape County shall operate two courthouses to Cape County may operate two courthouses. So 2000, I think 11, 12, that started the journey to 2020 to having one courthouse in Jackson where everybody goes, uh, six courtrooms, all the judges can be scheduled, um, don't have to you know stack them up or delay court, so we got it. Our access to the judiciary should be wide open with six courthouse courtrooms, um, and and so that that was uh, one of the things that I think has, has been a benefit to the county. The attorneys who live in Cape they don't gripe as much as you would think about having to drive to Jackson, and uh, so that that was kind of one of the concerns on the front end. Oh, you'll you'll never you'll never get past that. Like you you you, you cannot have court in Cape. But we're doing it. so. That's a good news story. Um, built the courthouse uh, after uh, with funds from the use tax. That's that's what's what's paying for that. Um, controversial tax, I know. Um, in this room, who who pays property taxes? Anybody? <laughs> Every year, you know what the amount is, right? Painful. Yes. Anybody pay sales tax today? All right. A couple people pay sales tax today daily. Anybody paid significant use tax this last year? A couple, okay. So, so um, 
it's it's you know no different than the state, but uh, it's it seems uh, to be I mean maybe maybe you specifically affects greatly um, affects some people at, you know pay at the state level also, but not not a tax that uh, almost in, in many cases one you can choose whether or not to pay um, based on on your on your uh, on whatever you do for a living. Um, some some folks can't get around it, and it's it's cost of doing business, but. Um, that's, that's how we pay for that. Um, recently, um, another, I, I would say, uh, high note for the county um, is that in, in a time when in the last couple of years you couldn't turn on this TV without seeing some major city on fire, um, discussions about defunding police, not supporting law enforcement. Um, we passed the law enforcement tax because the sheriff um, said, look, we're at a point now where um, we're at a breaking point. We're, we're getting to a spot where there's, there's the inmates are gonna be running the asylum. So we've gotta do something different. We've got a 200 bed jail and we got 260 um, prisoners. I don't have enough, I can't hire enough deputies. Budget's tight. Um, more, a greater percentage of, of funding was going out of general revenue to the sheriff. The rest of the county officers are kind of being neglected because we don't get to choose whether or not we have a jail. And so um, the citizens of this county said, hey, law enforcement is important. We're going to support our, our sheriff. We're going to make sure that uh, we've got a safe community to live in, that uh, the sheriff's going to have the resources that uh, that she needs in order to uh, provide that security. And, and we're, we're, we're going to take a different tack from what we saw on TV with uh, with the lawlessness and the anti-law enforcement and all those ways. So um, I'm happy to see that here where we still feel like law enforcement is important, where we respect our, our law enforcement officers, specifically the sheriff and, and, the, and the deputies there. So um, I think that's a, a good news story. Um, we're, we're currently in the process of expanding that jail, that um, the new jail that was built in 2000. Again, we're, we're looking at uh, going through the process of, of uh, expanding that, doing it without without uh, a bond issue. So we, we, we've, with that law enforcement tax, able to fund the expansion. So, um, you know, nobody likes, nobody likes talking about taxes. Nobody likes paying taxes. Um, but it's just one of those things you gotta do. Death and taxes, you can't get away from them. Um, we don't have to like taxes, we gotta keep them in check but also understanding that it's how we provide education, law enforcement, the common services that, that, that basically provide the fabric of our society and uh, keep us moving forward. So with that, yeah, that's uh,